Pastor uh, Mason asked me to speak this morning um, on being um, a chosen people, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation. And uh, as I've been studying it, I'm learning in so many aspects to, to those facts. I told him uh, last night this may take a few weeks, uh, but uh, what I decided kind of on my own was uh, if you could just give me two hours this morning, I'm good and uh, try to deal with all of it. No, I'm kidding. Um, but uh, I don't have a title for the message, and I kind of want to do this a little differently than I normally would teach a lesson. Like I kind of have like some bullet points and uh, some things I kind of want to definitely hit and uh, deal with the text extensively and the meaning of a chosen people, royal priesthood, holy nation, defining it from the text. Um, so we're going to deal with some questions, but the answers are going to be right here within chapter 1 and chapter number 2. Um, I'm going to ask if you can pray with me for a minute. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, we thank you for everything, God, that you do. God, everything, God, that you've done. God, for we're grateful to know you. And we're grateful, God, to be a part of your family. God, we thank you for redemption. God, we thank you for your Holy Spirit, God, that you've given us. God, that you've sealed us with, God, that we can rely on and trust. God, I thank you, God, for your word that never fails and endures forever. Yes. God, I pray, God, that your word will give us strength today. Amen. I pray, God, that your word will give us strength today. In Jesus' name, I say amen. amen. How many know that the joy of the Lord is our strength, right? Amen. It says that in the book of Nehemiah, chapter number 8. He says, um, and this was a tough time um, when Nehemiah would say this, a lot, of, a lot of chaotic things were going on, a lot of uh, destruction, bad things were going on at the time. Nehemiah says, the joy of the Lord yeah. is your strength, right? And that's going to be a paramount piece throughout this whole message, is the joy of the Lord is our strength. And the question becomes, where does the joy come from? What are we joyful about, right? What gives us this sense of happiness or this good feeling of rest and peace? We're where does it come from? And if you turn on um, Christian television, um, you'll hear it comes from, you know, material things or, um, you know, kind of like, you know, wealth, right? We heard the, the gospel of prosperity, right? We've all heard it. Um, we've, uh, we've heard it preached that, you know, that our, our joy or this sense of happiness can come from um, you know, family and, you know, friends and good health, right? We heard of the gospel of, you know, health, the health and wealth gospel, what they call it. Um, or even, you know, success. Being in America, uh, it's easy for us to get um, caught up in wanting or desiring or giving up our lives to obtain the American dream. Um, people from all over the world give up everything to come to America for the American dream, which deals with um, career success, uh, economic wealth, and good health, right? And it will be, for believers, I can see how, I disagree with, with it, but I can see how if we're not careful, our message can slowly become watered down and corrupted with the same ideas. That we will preach a message that says, come to the Lord and your life will be nice. Come to the Lord and your body will be healed. Come to the Lord and your family will be, you know, blessed and connected and unified and loving, right? We can easily slip into a message that says, here on earth, you will have great joy for the things you have, for the things you see. It's easy for us. I can see how 
if we're not careful, our message can slowly change to that, right? But here's the deal. The gospel message is not that. The gospel message, and I just kind of want to throw this out there so that if I say gospel message or preaching later on, I want you to know that preaching the gospel is not your life is good and all you need is Jesus and it'll be great, right? It's not the gospel message. The gospel message is your life is horrible and everything in your life has no importance and no value unless you have Jesus. Unless you know Christ. Nothing else matters. That's the gospel message we preach. Now, can you see how that message can be a little uncomfortable? It can offend a lot of people. Right? Can you see how that message will cause men to stumble, right? That message will get you kicked out of schools and airports and even some churches, right? But that's the message we preach. That's the message we stand for. And if you're a believer, we're not ashamed of that gospel. Amen? Amen. So if we talk about, because the underlying theme in the, in the book of Peter is a message to the believers that says, look, I know you're suffering. I know you're being persecuted, right? I know your families and your households are in shambles to some degree. You have no say-so anywhere, politically, socially. They call you weird and strange. I know all of this is going on, right? This is the underlying theme in Peter. This suffering, this persecution, this this idea that everything is going against Christianity. And in it, he says, for you are to have joy, right? How can you have joy in such a, such a condition, right? But you're to have joy, and you're to believe, and you're to continue in the faith, and you're to love one another, mm-hmm. and you're to proclaim the excellencies of God. And the question is, how? How can that be, Right? In their time, their persecution was a lot harder than ours, right? Because um, Rome was not tolerant to Christianity. In America, there's sort of a a, a semi-tolerant to Christianity. Can we agree? So our persecution isn't that isn't as um, tough as theirs, but nevertheless, there is persecution. There is suffering. We go through hard things because a lot of times when you come to the faith or because you're in the faith, you know, things can go haywire, right? Um, my brother right here, when he had came to the faith, all kind of things started started happening to him. I remember we would talk every day and something new was happening that was just terrible. And I, I'm, at one point I'm sitting there like, Lord, why don't you do something, right? He just got saved, you know, he's trying to live for you. Lord, give him some kind of peace some kind of relief, right? Yeah. But it's like, the Lord did promise us, you know, this relief from suffering. The Lord promised that even while, even while things are crazy, you have joy, right? Yeah. And I keep saying this because there's a reason why we have joy, right? What's the reason? Does anybody, anybody know? Because of salvation, because of the cross. Well, let's read this scripture, please. First Peter, chapter number one. We'll start at verse three. And I don't want to read this whole chapter, and I don't want to read the whole chapter two. Um, I want you guys to read it, but I want to kind of highlight a few things. So if you have verse three, it says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, and into inheritance that can never perish spoil or feed kept in heaven for you. We'll go to verse 5. Who through faith are shielded by God's power unto the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly what? Rejoice. Though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth 
than gold which perishes, even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. We'll stop right there. Um, he says, you know, the trials and all kinds of, you know, um, trials, he says. So it's not just one trial. All kinds of trials will come and prove your faith to be genuine, right? Try through fire. He says it's, it's greater than gold, right? Your faith is a treasure, right? Now here's the deal. He says the trials come to prove your faith to be genuine, right? So here's the deal. We can't. It's like this. You want to know who's a believer? You want to know that you're a believer? When your trials come, do you believe in the Savior? Right? Not to save you from your trials or because you lost your job or your car broke down or, you know, whatever hardship. But do you believe that Christ has redeemed you from your sins? Right? Do you remain in that faith, right? Or, when your trials come, do we forget about the Savior? Do we abandon the teachings of Christ, right? Do we go from a place of faith to a place of doubt? Where we say, no longer is God in control of my life, but I'm in control of my life. So we leave from the faith and we do what we want to do, right? Or we have an attitude like, you know, God is not there. So, he says, the trials is going to prove your faith genuine, right? So, if it's a question of who's a believer and who's not a believer, right? Because in the current state of, a, of where we live, everybody says they're Christian, right? Everybody says they believe in Christ or they went to the altar or they got baptized, right? But if you look at the state of their life, right? When the trials come, do they believe? Right? So we know that the trials test your faith, prove that it's genuine. Right? Also, it gives us a fact that says it's more precious than gold. Right? Try on the fire. That's going to be important because when you talk about your royal priesthood, it's kind of like to say that I'm a royal priesthood would be completely ludicrous. Right? I'm not a part of no royal family. I don't have any riches, right? And I live in a townhouse, right? A royal priest, right? Stays in a mansion, right? And he has unlimited resources. Right? So much so that if he wants something and it's yours, he can take it from you. He's one of royalty, right? But God says, your royal priesthood, right? And if we're not careful, we'll transition into thinking that royal priesthood is this earthly thing. Where if, if I want Brother Ant's iPad, I'm royal, I'm going to take that. Because that's who I am, right? This is the... <laughs> But what I'm saying is, there's no limit to, to where you can reach, what you can do, or how much you can do it. That's, that's royal. And then when it comes to being a priesthood, it's, it's that God has, has ordained this thing, right? God has made it this way. That's a royal priesthood, but that's not the kind of royal priesthood he's talking about. He's not talking about this earthly rule, right? We know all over the scripture, right? Right? He didn't say he was the king of this earth. He said, my kingdom is not of this world. Right? So our royal priesthood is not to say we should have riches or we should be able to do what we want to do when we want to do it. I'm better than you. I'm bigger than you. And I'm holy. Right? No. It's to say the royal priesthood is of God. And the royalties, the treasures that I have is faith in Christ who says I have an inheritance that's kept in heaven, uncorrupted, right? That's what we rejoice over, right? That's what we should rejoice over, right? That's what should 
there a happiness inside of you that makes you smile even in suffering?